The buyback amnesty recently received some updates. But what does this mean for firearms owners? Is the government finally ready to make their move? Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be taking a quick look at some new amendments to the 2020 Order and Council for Canada's gun buyback program. I saw this post earlier today by Tracy Wilson through Rod Giltaka over on X, and it was a link to some new amendments to the original 2020 OIC. This marks now the fourth iteration to the Amnesty Order in four years. The Amnesty Order and the Prohibition Order for Firearms, they're actually two separate orders. The Amnesty Order is the one that says you don't go to jail if you still have a prohibited firearm because you haven't been able to participate in the buyback yet, because there is no buyback yet. So that's the order we're talking about today. We're not talking about the actual pro Prohibition Order. There's been no changes to the firearm ban list or anything like that. This is just for the Amnesty Order, for the protections that you have. So this is the original Amnesty Order, and it came out on May 1st, 2020, alongside the Prohibition Order. And as you can see, it's not actually all that long. I'll put the link to all these stuff down in the description if you want to check them out, but it's, it's not all that long. It's been here for four years now, and it's uh, largely speaking pretty straightforward. And then about two years later, on March 4th, 2022, they released an order amending that amnesty order. They had to add some stuff to it because they didn't really get everything right the first time around. So they added a bunch of things in here that really should have been in the first amnesty order. And, and it is quite long. Like it's... It's several times longer than the original first amnesty order. And among other things, it was launched to fix these few issues. I'm not going to be going over these issues, but I do want to point out this was the time, if you guys remember, when they actually had to <laughs> let the Bank of Canada use their ARs because the amnesty order had banned government employees from protecting the Bank of Canada <laughs> with their own ARs, which is just, it was a good time. It was a good chuckle we had a couple years ago. And the one other big thing they did during this time is they actually extended the amnesty order out to October 30th, 2023. But there were also some other changes they had to make. They're all here. You can pause it and read it if you want, but we're not going to be going over that. We're moving on. And then their next amendments to the order were actually pretty straightforward. They came out October 20th last year in 2023. And that was to actually just extend the amnesty order to beyond the end of the next election. So that was the third iteration of the amnesty order. And now, on May 9th, they released another amendment to the Amnesty Order. So this is now the fourth iteration we've had in four years of this friggin' Amnesty Order. Now, the good news here is nothing really has changed all that much. But I figured I'd do an explainer video because a lot of people really seemed confused to exactly what was going on. And quite frankly, not a whole lot is going on. It's essentially a bunch of things that you were already thought were a part of the Amnesty Order because of course they should have been a part of the amnesty order. It just, it blows my mind just how, I don't know. It's, it's pretty, well, I'll just take a look. So if we take a look at the order, we're actually gonna skip over the regulations for now. We're gonna go down to the issues. So the issues here are why they feel they needed to make these amendments. And we're gonna take a look at this paragraph here. So it says the amnesty order, which this is the original amnesty order, not the one that we're looking at today, but the one that actually came out four years ago. The amnesty order originally only specified one pathway for affected businesses to turn in their prohibited items for destruction, namely by delivery to a police officer. The amnesty order originally did not provide affected businesses with other secure options for turning in the prohibited items for destruction that may be more convenient or that align with established business practices for disposal of prohibited firearms. Similarly, the original amnesty order did not allow for other persons or entities to take possession of prohibited firearms for the purposes of transportation or destruction. And finally, the amnesty order did not allow affected businesses to use shipping services to transport prohibited items to these persons or entities for destruction or to approve businesses for deactivation. So what all that effectively means is they didn't actually have any legal way of getting the prohibited firearms from a business to any sort of confiscation regime. There was just no no legal way for that to have happened, which is which is just incredible. Like you think that would have been a part of the original amnesty and the original buyback program? Like that was that was kind of the whole point of it, wasn't it? How do you how do you miss that? So the objective here of the amended amnesty order, so this is the order today, is to protect the affected businesses from criminal liability as they take the necessary steps to come to compliance with the law including by turning in their prohibited items for compensation. 
Specifically, the amended amnesty order is intended to make it easier for businesses seeking compensation to dispose of the prohibited items by permitting them to use shipping services to transport their prohibited items for deactivation or destruction. Other amendments would protect shipping service providers during the shipping process and destruction service providers during the destruction process. Finally, other amendments would clarify that businesses that offer deactivation services and their employees are protected while deactivating the prohibited firearms. And then if we scroll down right to the bottom, we can see the rationale for making these changes. So it says again, the amended amnesty order, which is the order we're looking at today, the amended amnesty order protects effective businesses as they take the necessary steps to come into compliance with the law, including by turning in the prohibited items for compensation. The amendments are intended to make it easier for businesses to dispose of the prohibited items by permitting them to use shipping services to transport their prohibited items for deactivation or destruction. Other amendments protect shipping service providers, destruction service providers, and businesses that offer deactivation services as well as their employees, as they possess the prohibited items while providing their respective services. Some of the activities involved in coming into compliance with the law could constitute certain criminal code offenses, for example, possession or transportation of prohibited items, i.e. firearm trafficking. <laughs> Without protection under the amnesty order, affected businesses and service providers would be exposed to criminal liability while taking the steps required to dispose of the prohibited items of or disposing of them. The amended amnesty order permits these activities and protects persons involved in them, thereby promoting public safety by ensuring the prohibited items are disposed of in a safe and secure manner. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I think that sounds wonderful. And that's kind of a common theme throughout this entire order here. They repeatedly refer to protecting people and public safety, which, I mean, public safety is the government of Canada's new favorite term. It's like Trudeau's own personal little notwithstanding clause. He uses it anytime he wants to pass a law in order to circumvent anybody's rights and anybody's freedoms. Just says, oh, public safety. You know, we've got to keep Canadians safe. That's our number one priority. Super important. Uh, which is just, that's a different video. We'll talk about stuff like that later. But I do find it particularly interesting how often they use it in this order. Because there's actually nothing in this order about keeping Canadians safe. Everything in this order, all of the rules and all the new policies they're introducing, it's all about keeping Canadians safe from criminal liability. Which means all of the talk of, of protection and public safety and all that stuff in here, that's to protect them from the government. Not to protect them from anybody trying to steal firearms or to people who might, you know, threaten... Canada Post employees or anything like that. That's not what these protections are. These protections are to keep the employees that the government is hiring to do their buyback to protect them from the government charging them with crimes. Like, like how, how crazy is that? That's, that's, fr Ugh, what a time we live in. That, that's crazy. The word protect shows up 21 times in this single order. That's how screwed people were if they were going to participate in this buyback. That's how much liability they were going to incur. Anybody who was hired as a seizure agent or a collection agent or anything like that, or even just participated in transporting seized items from A to B, they all could have been charged with very serious criminal penalties. Like, it's just, my, I don't know, it's mind, <laughs> mind blowing. So that's basically the change here today is they decided to not charge everybody who wants to help them with a crime. So... That's progress, I guess. It took them four years to come up with that. So <laughs> I don't know, man. They're crazy. So what did they actually change? What are actually the new rules that are coming in? So next, we're actually going to take a look at the provisions themselves that have changed. We're going to go through them real quick. If you're actually not interested in the specific provisions, you can just kind of skip ahead. I'll have it sorted into chapters down here, so just skip to the next chapter. So these are the amendments they made. So amendments to 1, subsection 2, 1 of the order which you actually have to go back to amnesty orders to see this part. But that part of the order is this section here. It says the amnesty period set out in subsection three is for all of these people. So on today's amnesty order, they are adding three new types of people to the list of people who qualify under the amnesty. Section G, these are essentially your seizure agents. I'm not sure what they're actually gonna be technically called, but the Saskatchewan Firearms Act refers to them as seizure agents. And that's basically these people here. Anybody who's participating in the transfer or confiscation of the prohibited firearms, those guys are roughly going to be called seizure agents, at least in Saskatchewan. And that's who's now protected under Section G, 
which means before this amnesty order came in, seizure agents were not protected under the amnesty, and they could have been charged for illegal possession or traffic of, trafficking of prohibited firearms. But now that's no longer a thing. Section H is for anybody who is an organization or an employee of those organizations. So this is effectively more people who are seizure agents. And then section I is any person who's participating in the deactivation of prohibited firearms rather than the transfer and destruction. These are the guys who are doing deactivation. And this is probably going to be basically your gunsmith. They're going to they're going to weld your gun shut or drill holes in the chamber and receiver and everything like that. They're, they're going to deactivate it somehow in accordance with, I think, the Firearms Act. I'm actually not sure if it's Criminal Code or Firearms Act. But there's a deactivation procedure and those are the guys who are going to do it. So next we have subparagraph 2, 2AV two of the order was replaced by the following. And that is this section here. And this section basically just describes that if you were a business, instead of having to hand your firearms into the police, you could actually send it back to the manufacturer. I don't imagine that you'd get any kind of compensation from the government, but you might get compensation from that manufacturer for returning their product. But that's between the business and the manufacturer at that point. And now they're basically just expanding that section to include other options for businesses to turn their firearms into. So in addition to being able to return your firearms to their original manufacturer, you can now also turn those items into people who are 1H in this section. And that was the people who are either an organization or an employee of the organization that is involved as a seizure agent. And then section C now allows you to actually take it to a carrier in order to participate in that buyback program. So even though Canada Post has outright said that they are not interested at all in helping with the buyback program or managing the buyback program or anything like that, the government of Canada is still giving themselves an option here to allow various carriers to help with that. So even if Canada Post doesn't, Pure Later or UPS or somebody else, somebody like that, can step up and fill in that gap if they decide to. I can't imagine anyone will want to do that, but they might if the government makes it lucrative enough for them. And if they do, this is another option. So this will be for businesses to take their firearms to a carrier or a shipping provider in order to have their firearms sent off to a destruction or deactivation location. And then the third section that they've added here is subsection 2.2 is expanded by adding all of this after section D. And all of this stuff here, this actually isn't any sort of new update. This is just them explaining what the purpose of the amnesty order is. So if I go back to our original amnesty order, this is section 2.2. And this is just the section that explains the purpose of the amnesty order. In case there's any sort of legal challenges or questions down the road, establishing what the purpose of the laws are and the purpose of the order itself is can be helpful in that context, but it's not any new information. They're basically just reiterating what laws they put into effect and why they put them there. Which means all of this is essentially not new information and there's not really anything to go over here. But if you want to understand better why they're making these changes, I mean, you can just read the information on screen, but we're going to be moving on. So at the end of the day, these amendments, they don't, they don't really change anything. It, it's just them put, finally putting down in words what you thought was already going to happen. I mean, without these amendments, they would have essentially made anyone they hired for the buyback into a criminal just, just overnight. They would have had to charge them with trafficking prohibited firearms or possession of prohibited items or something like that. Like, that was just ridiculous. So... After four whole long years, that's no longer a concern. So that, that's the big change here. You get hired by the government to do the job that they hired you to do. They'll no longer send you to jail for it. Yay! <laughs> huh. The other big change here is now that there are a number of options for businesses to easily participate in the bar buyback program if the government can get a program even going. Because that's the other thing here. This is a sort of a framework of laws and rules that permit a buyback program, but there's nothing actually in here that says anything about compensation or delivery schedules or anything like that or who's running it. Like this still isn't a buyback program. This is just this is just them giving themselves more options that they already said that they were going to pursue. So I, this really isn't much of a change. So it still seems like it's their plan to go ahead with somebody like Canada Post or Pure Later or UPS or somebody like that to do most of the collecting and transporting for the buyback. But as we all know, I mean, Canada Post has said twice now that they have no interest in doing it at all. However, there actually has been a lot of buzz lately about the, at least the, the business side of the buyback rolling out in the quote, next few months. I've seen a number of articles, especially from the CBC that have said it's a, you know, a few months away now. 
but I still haven't heard any specific date. I don't know exactly who they're quoting or what, what their, their intel is on that. They always said they were going to do that first before they did the buyback for individuals. All that being said, the business portion of the buyback has been just a few months away now for over four years. Who knows if it's actually going to happen this time around either. So, I'd like to thank you all for watching. I do have another buyback video coming out this weekend, actually. I've been meaning to make it for a couple of weeks, and I've been working on some other projects, but also just procrastinating a little bit. So stay tuned for that. As well, I've also been advertising my CCFR versus Canada series coming. Uh, this is to break down the CCFR's court case that they did last year, which is, I mean... <laughs> It's been taking me so long to compile, they're actually almost at a year now. I think they're, that was like 9 or 10 months ago. But most of the prep and the research is done. Now I just need to get the ideas and everything down on the paper, down into a script, so that I can make the videos. And so far it's looking like a 7 or, or 8 part series, something like that. So stay tuned for that. That should be coming out in early to mid-June, hopefully. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, get subscribed, stick around for that. All that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.